Time had hurtled me forward to my appointed time. It was 4.48 p.m. I debated going now or waiting another two minutes. Obviously, nobody was coming to rescue me. If I'm going to make it out of here alive, I thought, then it's up to me. With a sickening dread, I raised myself into a sitting position, my legs hanging over the side of the bunker. My eyes were riveted on the island I was preparing to swim to. I didn't dare look into the water I was about to enter with all the unseen dangers it contained. I knew with certainty that if I deliberated any longer, I would lose the edge and my courage would fail. Taking a deep breath, I summoned all my strength and grabbing hold of the side of the bunker, I leaned forward and prepared to jump. Suddenly, the silence that reigned over the ocean was shattered as a loud, commanding voice from behind me said, Don't leave the boat. Hello, my name's Keith Gregory. The passage I've just read to you is from a book, A Mighty Tempest, by Michelle and her mother, Rochelle. It recounts Michelle's three-day ordeal of being lost at sea. You're about to hear one of the most extraordinary testimonies of our time. This is a remarkable story of human helplessness and the intervention of a sovereign God. It had begun as a relaxing paddle in her canoe around the island where she and her mother were vacationing. Swift currents, however, slowly pulled her further and further away from the shore. Despite her vigorous paddling, she kept drifting southwest towards shark-infested seas. As darkness fell, the skies became heavy with storm clouds. Against incredible odds, Michelle battled to keep her tiny canoe afloat during a vicious tropical storm. For three more days, she fought exhaustion and severe sunburn as she watched hungry sharks circle her capsized canoe. However, for Michelle Hamilton Gregory, the miracle is not that she survived, but how she survived. Michelle's experience with a merciful God during those three days is a testimony that will not only thrill, but challenge you. This is a modern day Jonah tale of a girl who went out to sea not knowing God, but was brought to a place of repentance, obedience, and total dependence on God. So join with me now in hearing Michelle tell of this amazing testimony of how a horrifying ordeal turned into a personal journey of having 100% faith in the midst of a storm. Well, good evening. It's so wonderful to see so many of you here in church tonight. I would just like to open the service by dedicating the rest of it to our Lord Jesus Christ, whom even the winds and the seas obey. Before I had got lost at sea, I had never read a Bible. But upon returning to dry land, my mother presented me with this very Bible. And as I was flicking through the scriptures, I came upon a scripture in Jonah. And you're welcome to turn with me if you like, or I'll just read it to you. It's in Jonah 2, verse 3. And it seemed very apt considering I had been lost at sea for three days. It says here in Jonah 2, verse 3, For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your willows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The waters encompassed me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remember the Lord. 
and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. I hope that if you have come here tonight with a question in your heart about whether God exists or whether he is sovereign, I pray that you will leave here with the answer, the only answer, that we do indeed serve a God of awesome power, incredible mercy and amazing grace, if only you have the faith to believe. I'd like to take you on a journey with me to where this ordeal all began. And I have been in Japan for a year teaching executives conversational English. And as my contract drew to a close, I decided that before returning home to Australia, I would visit around the islands of Southeast Asia. And I've been told about this island called Boracay. It was described as being one of the very last remaining tropical paradises on Earth. And I was told that I had to visit it quickly before it was invaded by tourists. So I decided to give my mum a call, who'd been very under stress with her job and raising a family single-handedly. And I said, Mum, I want to take you on a relaxing tropical holiday vacation, and you can wind down and lose all your stress. And I promised her it would be a holiday that she would never forget. And needless to say, I have lived up to my part of the bargain, because she is still remembering it. When we arrived on this island, however, it was everything the tropical brochures said it would be. Just powder fine white sand for as far as the eye could see in these magnificent turquoise blue waters. It truly was paradise. But the island indeed was very remote, located some 950 miles south of Manila. They hadn't even established hotels on the island yet. There were just thatched bungalows on the beach no electricity, not even telephones. So as you can imagine, it was really quite primitive. From the moment that we first ar arrived on the island, we were told that there were natives around the other side. And being the very curious person that I was, I was really quite keen to go around and visit with them. So on about the fourth day that we were there, we decided to hire what's known in the Philippines as a bunker. What that actually is is a wooden dugout canoe with two outriggers on the side. And when I stretched my arms out, it literally wasn't much bigger. Only seven foot long and so narrow, you couldn't actually sit inside it. You had to put a plank of wood across the top as a bench and sit on that. So it possibly wasn't the most seaworthy going vessel to begin with, but at 22 you don't think of things like that, you really don't. Anyway, I had to try and talk my mother into getting into this canoe because she was frightened of water. I mean, she is so terrified of water, she has a bath and she gets frightened. So trying to talk her into getting into this small canoe and circumnavigating this island was really no small feat. But with my powers of persuasion, I managed to talk her into it, and off we went. However, after about an hour, when the boat began to leak as well, and we were having to bail water occasionally, she said, Michelle, look, I have had enough of this. I want you to drop me back to shore. So I dropped her back off to shore, and I'll never forget the very last thing she said to me. Please, Michelle, don't go out too far. In retrospect, if only I'd listened to mother's voice. Mother really does know best. <laughs> However, whilst I remained within the tranquil waters of the lagoon, I was relatively safe. But once I endeavoured to get around this point, to try and get around the other side of the island, all the ocean currents from behind the island very, very quickly dragged me out to sea. And I found within a very short space of time, I was literally in deep water and deep trouble. To give you an idea of the alarming speed that I was moving at, by the time it was 4.45, I was already so far away from land that all I could see was a white slither of sand on the beach. That's how fast I was moving. It was at that point that I realized if I did not leave that boat, and make the attempt to swim to shore, then I was most assuredly going to be spending the night at sea. It was at that point that I put on my mask, snorkel and flippers, hopped onto the outrigger of the canoe and prepared to jump. But just before I did, I heard this 
incredibly loud, audible voice call out, don't leave the boat. My first reaction was one of just the most extraordinary relief. I looked behind me, expecting to see my friend John coming in his launch, saying, don't leave the boat, we're here to rescue you. But when I looked around in every single direction, there was absolutely nothing there. Now, I was a person who was always fully in control of all my faculties and not prone to hearing voices. So I really couldn't work out where this voice was coming from. I knew I wasn't hallucinating. I'd only been out there a couple of hours. So where was this voice coming from? I waited about five minutes, then said to myself, I don't care who the voice belongs to. If I don't leave this boat, I'm going to be spending the night at sea. So again, I hopped onto the outrigger of the canoe and prepared to jump. And again, this voice that was so powerful boomed out this command. Don't leave the boat. I got such a fright, I fell face first into the water. And when I crawled back into the canoe, I was actually more afraid of what this voice would do to me if I disobeyed <laughs> than the thought of spending that night at sea. But when I heard the first clap of thunder peel out across the sky and sheet lightning began to light up the sky, I realized I had made the very biggest mistake of my life because not only was I lost alone in what was essentially a child's canoe in the middle of the South China Sea, but I realized I had been caught in the midst of a tropical storm. That night was such a night of overwhelming terror that even telling you about it today, it doesn't seem possible that it happened to me. As I said, the boat was too narrow to hop inside. All I could do was lie wedged si sideways with my hands gripped onto the front of it. It was like riding the car of a roller coaster. I would ride these enormous waves and get to the crest of this wave and just look down before I plunged into the next trough. I kept saying to myself, the waves can't possibly get any bigger, but as the night progressed and I moved into deeper water, these waves just got bigger and bigger and bigger until I had mountainous walls of water just coming towards me and crashing into the boat. All I could do was bail water frantically just to stop this craft from sinking, while all night torrential rain poured on me and thunder and lightning peeled out across the sky. I can assure you it's nothing but the grace of God that I'm even standing here talking to you today. However, at 5 a.m. that next morning, an even worse fate awaited me, because at 5 a.m. that next morning, an enormous wave just crashed onto the boat and tipped me out. And after coming incredibly close to drowning, and let me assure you, drowning is a most unpleasant way to die, I reached the surface and swum to the boat, only to discover that not, on, not only was this boat now capsized, but somehow it had vacuum sealed itself to the ocean. And no matter what I cried, I could not turn this craft over. And in the storm, one of the outriggers had broken off, and the other one was breaking away from the side. With each wave that crashed upon it, I would hear, Ur. I knew I conceivably had a couple of hours, maybe a day, before that other outrigger broke off. And then there was absolutely nothing to hold on to. But of course, the saving grace of today was surely my mother was coming to rescue me. I don't personally believe that there is an age that you ever reach that in the height of a crisis, your parents are not coming to rescue you. <laughs> and it was the most devastating feeling of betrayal that as hour upon hour passed, it became obvious that my mother was not coming to rescue me. It's probably why I got second degree burns on my face because I spent the majority of that day looking up into the sky for a plane or a helicopter, looking across the water expecting any moment that a boat would come powering towards me with my mum in it saying, it's all over now, Michelle, you can relax, I'm here to rescue you, but that moment just never came. What had happened is I had gone out with a money belt wrapped around my waist and contained in that money belt was both our passports, 
all our travellers' checks and all our cash, not only do you have a lot of tenacity when you're 22, but you're also incredibly stupid. So my mother didn't have a single solitary cent. And unlike this extremely generous country that we live in, Australia, the Philippines is not so. The Philippines is a third world country. You can't just pick up a phone and dial search and rescue. They required 1,200 American dollars up front in cash before they would even consider sending out a search. And she had no money and there were no telephones on the island. To be quite honest, in the five years since this happened to me, I could not truly appreciate what she went through as a mother until three months ago I became a mother myself. Only then could I truly understand what she must have gone through to know that her child was lost at sea in what was essentially just a child's canoe. She experienced the same storm on the island that I did out in the ocean, and yet there was not a single thing that she could do to help me. And at that same moment, I'm feeling that exact same feelings of powerlessness. There was nothing I could do to help myself. I was up to my neck in water with just one arm wrapped around the remaining outrigger. All I could do was sit and wait for help. As the sun began to descend on the second night and it became obvious I wasn't going to get rescued by human intervention and whilst my own, what I thought were wonderful character traits at the time of strong will and self-determination and courage and tenacity, probably the same character traits that had got me into this trouble in the first place, I realised didn't have the power to save me. I suddenly thought that perhaps it may well be time to turn to God. God was my trump card. I was saving him. If all else failed, I would turn to God. And since all else had failed, it was him that I now turned to. I remembered something my mother had said to me in Singapore. We had been separated for a year and we'd just been reunited before embarking upon this holiday to the Philippines. And she'd come to me with this startling revelation. She came to me and she said, Michelle, I have been searching for 40 long years and I have finally found what I was looking for and it's changed my whole life. I've met this wonderful man. I said, well, he sounds terrific. Tell me all about him. Who is it? And she said, his name is Jesus. I said to myself, the woman has completely lost the plot and needs immediate counselling. And then she started to launch into this lecture as mothers do and when they become Christian mothers it's a double whammy lecture that you get that you're not saved and your eternal life. And I said, Mum, calm down and stop right there. I said, I am glad that you have found this in your life and truly I was. But I said, my life is going along so successfully at the moment and frankly, well, I don't really believe I have a need of this Jesus. And she said, well, Michelle, I wouldn't want to lecture you. But as a mother, I would like to say this one thing. Perhaps one day, God may have to bring you right down on your knees. And as a mother, I hope that never, ever has to happen. But if it does, just remember that his hand is always outstretched to you. And he's just waiting for you to call out to him for help and say, God, I need you. Help me. I said, sure, mum, I'll keep that in mind. Four days later, I was lost at sea and in the very predicament that she had warned me of. God had brought me right down on my knees. So far down, there was only one place I could look and that was up. I should point out at this time that I was a person who had grown up with no organised religion to speak of. God was someone who was sort of up on a throne in the clouds and was like Santa Claus. He could be everywhere at the one time. But I'm also living witness to the fact that not a single word of the Lord returns void because my dad had sent me to Sunday school just twice. And as I sat there desperately trying to remember any concept I had of this God, suddenly the scripture popped into my mind. Nobody enters the kingdom of heaven but through me. 
I will never be able to tell you how totally astonished I was at that moment that I had from way back when I was seven remembered that scripture and a little bit more came back to me heaven or hell up or down and I realized at that point that I had a destination I had a decision and I had a choice as do we all I would imagine as you sit here very comfortably in your chairs death must seem like a million miles away impossible inconceivable and I know when I first took that boat out in that perfect paradise on that magnificent day death was impossible at 22 you're invincible you're immortal nothing can touch you but when I was out in the midst of that storm and I looked at every wave rolling towards me and I realized each one of those waves had the potential to kill me suddenly death became a lot more imminent I realized right then that my life could be snatched away from me in but a moment. Frankly, I wasn't willing to take the risk. I had to know if my body expired, my soul was going up. I had to know that if I died in the next couple of minutes, I was going to heaven. And I knew there was only one way to get there, and that was through this Jesus. It was at that point of complete realization that I looked up into the sky and I called out to God and I asked him the most important question of my life. Am I going to die? And I didn't really ever expect an answer. But down from heaven boomed this voice that I can only describe to you as sounding like thunder. I don't know whether any of you here have ever sat outside and heard thunder but it goes right through your body and just shakes your entire body. And that is the voice of God. Not only could I hear this voice audibly, but it went through my fingertips and my hair and every part of me recognized that this was the voice of my creator, even though I did not know him. And he called out to me, no, you are not going to die. I was in such awe and disbelief that the creator of the universe was personally speaking to me out in the middle of the ocean that I couldn't be sure if I'd heard him correctly. So I asked him, can you say that again? <laughs> you may well have done the same thing. And again he called out to me in a voice so filled with authority and conviction that I couldn't deny it. You are not going to die. Now, having come from such a secular background, I believe that there was no such thing as a free lunch, not even with God. And I wanted to know, well, what do you want in return for this gift of life? Because surely there must be something. And I thought he was going to say something very dramatic, like I want you to become a missionary or join the nunnery or something like that. But he said something even more bewildering. He said, I want 100% of your faith. Now, I didn't really understand that concept, but frankly, you get to the point where you're willing to say just about anything to save your own life. And so I did. I said, sure, God, you have 100% of my faith. God proved to me in his next statement that he is really not a God to be trifled with. I believe now that there is no fool greater than the fool that believes he can fool God. Because God proved to me that he's not some God that's somewhere up on a throne in, a, in the clouds. Here is a God that is living and is real and knows what you're thinking before you even thought it. So you better not be blasé in making a commitment of faith because he called out to me in a voice so filled with anger that it terrified me. No, not 90%. I said 100% faith. After that, I was completely terrified of him. And I realized that no matter the facts at this stage, that I had second degree burns, I had hypothermia, I had severe dehydration, my tongue was this big hanging out of my mouth, I was exhausted beyond human comprehension. Can you imagine having to be up to your neck in water with one arm wrapped around the outrigger of canoe, while for the last couple of days, waves constantly pound your body. And this God that was invisible was asking me to believe. 
I knew that if I had that much doubt, he would know. And again, frankly, I wasn't willing to take the risk. So right then, I called out to him. And I said, honestly, I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know whether you're going to send a big bird down from the sky to pluck me from these waters and deposit me on dry land. I don't know. But I believe you have the power to save me. And I believe you will save me. And I believe it was in that moment that I made that 100% commitment without doubt that I was both physically and spiritually saved. Because God said it is by grace through faith that we are saved and that not of ourselves, it is a gift of God. And some people have said that I had just about the longest water baptism in history and that may well be true and, and frankly I'm still thirsty. As the saying goes, water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink and that is the truth. You know, there are so many amazing miracles in the story, supernatural miracles, miracles that happened to me, miracles that happened to my mother. Obviously, I can't tell you all of them in one meeting, but there is one that stands out in my memory as being by far the most amazing, possibly because I didn't think anything like that ever existed, certainly not in the real world, perhaps in children's fairy tale books. So when I looked upon the water to see this vision of three angels, it was just the most amazing thing I have ever seen. My first reaction was one of just complete horror. I remember looking down and praying to God that when I looked up, they would just no longer be there because it was so incredibly frightening. But every time I looked up, they were still very much there. What stands out the most in my memory is how toweringly tall they were. I remember having to crane my neck to look up at these beings that just seemed enormous. And what was wonderful about them was, I don't know whether any of you here have ever been out on a boat at night, but it is incredibly dark and it is like you lose all your senses. I felt as if I had been caught prisoner in this just this prison of darkness. And yet this white, bright, opalescent light that shone from them covered the entire water. And it was as if I had been released from this prison of darkness and this light had set me free. And I didn't understand it then, but now I know that is what truly represents Christianity, is when you are taken out of the bonds of darkness by believing in our Lord Jesus Christ, it is his light that sets us free. The very strange thing about these creatures was there were three of them, and there was no division between the three as they stood together, shoulder to shoulder on the water, almost as if they were in a mold. Before I had even a chance to recover from the sight of seeing these three angels, I suddenly felt a dense heaviness as if something was leaning on my back and I felt a, a tingling all up and down my spine. And suddenly the air about me began to become filled with this incredible electricity, almost as if somebody had cut a thousand volt cord and just slashed the air with this amazing electricity, sort of almost like an electromagnetic force field surrounded me. If I touched the air, it went zzz. I looked down to suddenly see the wings of an angel had enfolded me like that. It had come from behind and wrapped its wings around me. Again, my feeling was one of just horror. I just kept praying, if only I could swim away from these creatures. But you know, the most amazing thing happened. After about 10 minutes, when my fear finally began to subside, this incredible peace descended on me, a peace that I can only describe to you as being sweet, a peace I have never experienced before and possibly never shall again, a peace that made absolutely no sense. And I'll tell you why it made no sense, because yet again, I was caught in the midst of a tropical storm with seas raging all around me and I should have been terrified and yet I felt completely safe. It is the same just as the Bible says it, that it is a peace that goes beyond our understanding. You know, this night in some regards was even worse than the first. 
because these three angels disappeared and the light diffused from the wings of this angel and I was yet again in darkness. And without the relative safety of the boat, I would sometimes be picked up by these enormous waves and just tossed into the ocean and I would lose contact with the boat and I would be doggy paddling around in the South China Sea for what would seem like an eternity until I could not move my arms anymore and I felt myself moving towards death. Do you know that every time that night, and it must have been eight to ten times, either I connected with that boat again or it connected with me. <laughs> and I find that really just amazing. But what was more amazing was that all night this angel held me in its wings. Some people have asked me, why do you believe that you have heard the audible voice of God and seen angels? Honestly, I don't know. It's not because I'm a worthy Christian, because I have met people so much, much more worthy than I. But if there is one reason, it is because I have not heard the audible voice of God and seen angels for me. I have heard the audible voice of God and seen angels for you. Our God did not suddenly become a mute. He has an audible voice and he uses it. He has angels and he uses them. And you may not see them, but I can assure you that they are there. You know, all throughout this wonderful Bible, there are stories of God's angels as both his ministers and his messengers. And since he makes a statement that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he doesn't change, then we must assume that if he used them then, he uses them now. You know, I think I can fairly confidently say that none of you here will probably ever, ever get lost at sea. But you may have come here tonight feeling as if you are. You may have come here tonight feeling as if your life is a storm that is raging all around you. You may feel as I did when I was tossed from this boat and I was drowning. I couldn't even work out which way was up. It's, you feel like a sock in a washing machine. You can't work out which way is up. And every time I reach the surface, just to catch my breath, just to get a gasp of air, another wave would crash upon me and keep me down. What I went through literally, you may be going through symbolically in your own life. You may feel as if you are drowning under a sea of problems and a sea of burdens. And every time you reach the surface, just to catch your breath, just to get a gasp of air, another wave of financial burden crashes upon you and keeps you down. Another wave of marital distress and ill health and unemployment constantly bombarding you and keeping you down. You may feel as if you're adrift and alone from the God that you do know. You may feel as if you're surrounded by hungry human sharks. I feel confident that I can say to you, in those moments when you're at your deepest darkest point when you feel the most alone indeed you are not alone but that the wings of the Lord are surrounding you and upholding you and keeping you safe because that's the God that I met the God that says I'll be your fortress and your strength and your deliverer the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and since God makes a statement that there is no partiality with men if he would come to the South China Sea and rescue Michelle Hamilton, then he will also come right here to this church and rescue you too and meet you at your point of need. Because if there's one thing I discovered about God, his love is so immense. He loves us so much that he can reach out and touch us from anywhere. The next day I encountered something almost as frightening as when I first saw these angels, and that was sharks. I knew from reading that the Philippines are simply renowned for being both shark and pirate infested. And by this stage I had begun bleeding into the water. But I can assure you that nothing prepares you for the sight of the fins of two man-eating sharks powering towards your boat at the most incredible speed. It is as if somebody has reached inside your chest and has grabbed your heart and is squeezing the life from you. 
I was in total shock for about 30 seconds. Then I managed to throw myself onto the hull of this upturned boat. But that indeed was a mistake because it was covered in the slimy green algae. And when I lay on it, on my stomach with only one remaining outrigger to hold on to, a wave from behind swept me like a torpedo straight into the path of these sharks so that when I surfaced, they were just 15 metres right in front of me. Now, I don't know whether perhaps at the time I had seen too many Jaws movies, but I truly believed that I was dead. I just saw my entire body being ripped apart in a feeding frenzy. I'm swimming back to the boat telling myself, don't splash, don't splash, don't splash, expecting any moment to feel the serrated teeth of one of these sharks just clamp on to the back of my leg when suddenly this voice calls out the strangest thing. Do not fear, for they will not hurt you. I said, what? I'm bleeding. There's sharks. They're going to eat me. And he said it again. Do not fear, for they will not hurt you. And I suddenly realized what God was saying. I said I'd save you, didn't I? Now where's that 100% faith. I realized right then, if God had created this entire universe and even these sharks, then surely he had the power to stop them from biting me too, if that be his will. But what he required of me was 100% faith. Now, I don't think I need to tell you that in my lifetime, there has not been anything I have found more difficult to do than with hungry sharks surrounding my boat about to devour me to believe that God was going to save me. But let me also say that in the moment that I believed with 100% faith, those sharks swam away as if they had never seen me at all. Now that, I believe, is what God is asking from each and every one of us, is to have 100% faith no matter what our circumstances. They probably won't get more insurmountable than being surrounded by hungry sharks. But you know, I would imagine that sometimes it really feels as if it is, as if you're surrounded on every side by hungry human sharks about to devour you. God is asking you in those moments to trust him beyond what you see, beyond what is obvious to the eye. To me, it was obvious those sharks were going to eat me. God is asking you in those moments when everything seems impossible to trust him beyond logic, beyond rationale, beyond human emotion. He's just asking you to have faith because he is the God of the impossible. He delights in doing impossible things if only you have the faith to believe. You know, I believe in the power of prayer. I most assuredly do. But I also believe that prayer without faith is dead works. Faith is the currency that our God works with. When Jesus walked this earth, he did not say, your prayers have healed you. He said, your faith has healed you. Go, your faith has made you well. And he doesn't change. He still requires that same faith of us today. And if he requires not 90, but 100% from Michelle Hamilton, then he requires not 90, but 100% from you also. You know, God makes this incredible statement. I believe one of the most incredible of the whole Bible. He says, it is impossible for you to please me without faith. Can you imagine such a statement? That with all your good works, and all your good deeds, it is impossible to please the living God without having faith. A half an hour after I saw these sharks, I finally saw my rescue boat. An enormous vessel came powering towards me. I took off my singlet top and started waving frantically like a lasso. But this rescue ship actually passed me by. I can't tell you how devastating it was that my only sign of rescue in three days just passed me by. I don't know whether they had the boat on autopilot, 
but there was absolutely no sign of life. I sat there praying, please let somebody see me. And just when I'd given up, a figure appeared on the stern of the boat, looked into the water, pointed at me, and waved. It was the most exciting moment. Then suddenly other figures joined him on the stern of the boat and they all waved and said, beckoned, you come, swim. This is half an hour after I'd seen the sharks. It was like, couldn't you come to me? I had to get back into the depth of that water and leave the safety of that boat, which had become almost my closest friend apart from my saviour. And I made that one mile swim to that boat, having to stop every couple of moments from the absolutely excruciating agony my body was in. I finally got to the rescue boat and they threw a rope down the side and said, you climb up. I held on to this rope and this fishing vessel must have been incredibly old because it had just rusty fragments all over it. And as I held onto the boat, they hauled me up the side and just ripped every part of my second degree burns. I thought to myself, I'm going to let go, I'm going to let go. And God said, no, you hang on. They pulled me over the side. And just before I collapsed into absolute unconsciousness, I heard them call out, Serena, Serena, it's an Americano mermaid. I thought to myself, what? Didn't make sense at the time, but I guess you don't expect to look into the middle of the South China Sea, hundreds of nautical miles out to sea, and see a girl with long blonde hair wearing bikinis and flippers. It really <laughs> might have been a natural assumption. They said it was because the Filipinos are extremely superstitious. They believe that the mermaid takes the life of one fisherman every year and they thought that if they brought me on board, I was going to kill them all. They said they didn't realise until they undid my money belt and pulled out my Australian passport did they realise that I was just a mere mortal and not the catch of the day after all. I turned to this young man, one of the only that spoke broken English, and I said to him, because I could barely speak, thank you for saving my life. And he turned to me and said, it is not I that saved your life, but God. And that reiterated every single thing that had happened to me. It wasn't them that had saved my life. It wasn't me that had saved my life. It was God that had saved my life. At this point, my mother was completely distraught. At this point, she was flying back to the island of Boracay. Her, she had finally been lent the 1,200 American dollars, and she had mounted an aerial search, which had proved fruitless. She got back to the island, and as you can imagine, she was really quite angry with God. She said she stormed up and down that beach, saying, God, only three months ago, I gave my life to you and I entrusted my children's life to you and now you've stolen one of them away from me. What kind of a God are you anyway? She said she vacillated backwards and forwards between throwing herself on his mercy and being incredibly angry with him. But she finally came to a place where she realised, your children don't belong to you. Your children are on loan to you a gift from God for as long as he sees fit because we are our father's children before we are our parents' children. She then walked into a little church which had clearly not been used a lot. One of the doors was hanging off its hinges but she knew that she was in the house of the Lord. And there she felt God calling her to surrender her child back to him. And there, just as Abraham had once done with his son Isaac, she surrendered me back. And she said, God, I don't know why you're doing this to me, but I just ask that you will keep her safe. And God called out to her, not in an audible voice, what I believe is one of the most important statements of this entire testimony. You only have a piece of the puzzle. 
I have the whole plan. Trust me. And she did. She didn't believe that she would ever see me alive again, but she believed that God in his infinite wisdom knew what was best because she was just the potter, sorry, she was just the clay and he was the potter. She then got on a plane and went to Manila and there she was picked up by Australian embassy officials. He took her back to his home and he sat her down and he said to her very, very brutally, Mrs Hamilton, I don't know how to say this to you, but the chance that your daughter survived in that little craft she went out on in those terrible tropical storms is absolutely remote. But in the event that her body has been washed up somewhere on shore, would you like us to send it back to Australia? She said at that moment he may as well have picked up a dagger and plunged it straight through her heart. How was she as a mother to answer that question? Only four days ago we were walking hand in hand down the beach talking about our wonderful future and now I was suddenly a body to be zipped up in a bag and sent back to Australia? She said she could never answer him and by the grace of God she didn't have to because suddenly the phone rang and he very complacently dawdled up the stairs to answer it but come bounding down two at a time saying, Mrs Hamilton, Mrs Hamilton, you are not going to believe this but your daughter Michelle is alive. She has been rescued by Filipino fishermen and listen to this, she is in a hotel room in Manila just one street away. Now that is a story about the glory of God. You know, it was as if we had gone out not really knowing God, but we come to a place of repentance and obedience and 100% faith had brought us back to each other just one street away. It was the same God that had not only brought a daughter back to a mother, but the same God that had brought a daughter back to himself and back into his kingdom. You know, when I came back from the ocean, I truly believed that I'd been tested enough. You know, but even I, after that terrible ordeal I went through, God felt a need to test me again. I went through six months of being in bed with sickness. I went through financial poverty. I had unsaved loved ones, so I've been there. And I said to God, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to hurt me? And he said, no, I'm trying to bring you to a point of 100% faith. It is a daily walk. God has his hand outstretched to you tonight as he had his hand outstretched to me. And he's asking you, don't harden your heart tonight. Don't turn away from him. Because he is a God of awesome power incredible mercy and amazing grace and he can reach into your life and supernaturally change it. If you need a touch from heaven tonight, the Lord would like to give you one. But the one thing I found out about God is he doesn't break into your life. He needs permission to do a miracle in your life and you give him that permission when you give him your faith. So if you've come here tonight seeking restoration, seeking a miracle or seeking just to please the living God, then he is asking you to have faith. You know, you need to ask if you want to receive, and you can receive that faith tonight. So he has his hand outstretched to you. And for those of you who perhaps do not know the Lord, if you perhaps have backslidden, God is saying to you, don't wait till tomorrow. The enemy will say tomorrow, you know, when my mother told me about Jesus, I said, when I'm less successful, when I'm older, when I'm sicker. The enemy says tomorrow. Jesus says today. Today is the day of salvation. There is no other. Don't wait till 11 o'clock, 10.30, you could be taken. So he has that hand outstretched to you today. And he's asking you, don't turn away, but reach up and grab a hold of that hand of hope and say, yes, I believe with 100% faith. Thank you. Since Michelle's traumatic experience and miraculous rescue, she and her mother have not returned to Boracay Island. 
Upon arriving in Manila, they were inundated with interview requests from newspapers, magazines and television networks. Within a short time, the media had dubbed her the Aussie Mermaid. Following a special ceremony honouring the crew of the rescue ship FV Alistar, Michelle and Rochelle returned to Australia, where they were reunited with Rochelle's two younger daughters, Angeline and Natalie. During the following 18 months, Michelle and Rochelle wrote the account of their ordeal, giving testimony to God's grace and power. Your name is Savior, Messiah, the one who has saved us from death. Jesus, beautiful, you continue to show us your grace. Your name is Counselor, Father, your name is still holy. God, the Son of Man, the one 